I don't really want to be bothered about the ergo's defense mechanisms. I'm going to find out what's stopping the ergo from functioning properly. Hi everyone. It's traditional in psychodynamic psychotherapy to talk of ego defense mechanisms. A so-called neurosis appears to be defended, as seen in many observable phenomena, including general resistance and symptom substitution. From this, an interesting question with strong clinical implications naturally arises. If, from clinical observation, complexes appear to be defended, what is the origin of this defense? Where in the biopsychosocial stack is the functional core of this defense? Following on from Carl Gustav Jung's pioneering work into the psychophysiological nature of complexes, Steve and Pauline Richards have demonstrated through the use of clinical capnography, as well as through other qualitative clinical observations, that, in fact, complexes appear to defend themselves. They appear to have a certain degree of autonomy that endows them with the capacity to attempt to evade detection and therefore functional dissolution. With this in mind, one of our Carter 4 students asked Stephen Pauline in a high-level first-year IPSA professional training seminar whether a complex that appears to be solely cognitive is, in fact, simply that, that is, cognition alone, or if it appears to be that way from the perspective of the ego because it is heavily defended. This question allowed Steve and Pauline to speak to the dynamics of complex defense in great detail, using, among other things, OCD as an example. We really hope that you enjoy. That's a, an interesting uh, point to raise because where does the defense sit in that biopsychosocial stack? You know, it's traditional to talk about uh, ego defense mechanisms. And you know, when we started, we accepted that just implicitly that that would be the case. However, it became clear, particularly when we were employing psychophysiological tests like the capnograph with people, that these partial personalities, as Jung called them, seem to have sufficient autonomy to be able to defend themselves. And that was really interesting when, when we, we saw that not only was this happening psychologically, but physiologically, and then both concurrently. So it depends where the defense mechanism is sitting and what the overall algorithm is homeostatically for the arrangements, if you like, of the complex, the constellation of it, as Jung would have called it. Because sometimes complexes act paradoxically to appear to be harmful, but they were set up under conditions where the overall homeostasis of that person in a certain situation meant that a complex was necessary. And it's as if it's just carrying on, even though the external situation no longer warrants it. And that's where, first of all, suppression occurs, which is, as we've discussed in the recent videos, you get that partition of consciousness where the defense of the ego is devolved to a complex. The ego is no longer defending itself. It's shut down, doesn't want to know. So you go over there and deal with that. So this split off part then acts autonomously and under the conditions that it was set up, that means suddenly that the ego is now the problem to the ego. So therefore the complex knows better and it's a kind of autoimmune response. All of that can happen, but the manifestation of that might be that cognition is allowed to go through. It's allowed and it circulates because it doesn't solve. It's allowed because it doesn't solve. So it's kind of a defense mechanism, but not of the ego in that specific scenario. It's actually the complex, which is allowing the ego to ruminate. So you can't, you can't find it. Meanwhile, the instincts will be making an assessment. This is literally based on the genome itself, reading its environment over its, its lifespan trajectory and the time release of, of instinctive pressure to force us to adapt. And it will say, okay, suboptimal adaptation, but we're still surviving. 
we'll leave you alone for now. And then suddenly it'll say, no, no, not having this anymore, push. So there's a surge of libido coming from instinct and the complex has to attempt to cap it. If it can't cap it, it does what Freud said, it will perfect it into something else that the ego will receive, which might at this point in a, a scenario, for example, become obsessive compulsive disorder, fully formed with both ruminative cognition and displacing activity in the world. The displacement then is the secondary effect that follows the cognition. You usually find that the cognition manifests before the, the behavior. Uh, and the affect itself, which would cure it, has been lost to consciousness. So there is a struggle going on, but it's beneath the level of the ego and it's a homeostatic dysregulation. So lots of things like that can happen. But hopefully to return more clearly to, to your question and with respect to where you get the manifestation of cognition. Affect broadly, we consider to be the carrier wave of instinct. In other words, it is a, a form of consciousness, but it's directly plugged into instinct, which itself is plugged into gene expression and the genome. If you can follow that back, if you can ride the conveyor belt of the affect back, then you'll bypass those areas where the more superficial complexes, which are the ones that have been created by interaction with the environment, operate. You get past that. And you head back inwards towards the environment of the instincts, which is a dream world in many respects. The world that some people call archetypal, because it's a projection into experienceable psychology of the instinct itself and behind that of the genome and the wide scenario that that particular instinct will represent. But affect gets you there quicker. So you allow, it, you allow yourself to go with that and experience what comes up, because that is a direct communication. That can be um, interpreted as being an archetypal image. You, you could say that the process is active imagination. You can give it any of those labels you like. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to pressure test your model of understanding, whatever that might be, of that experience, and then see what the outcome is. In our experience, if there's too much theory applied to that, and we would argue that at times uh, an archetypal model is too much because of the referent you get between the image that's used by the ego internally and the culture overrides the natural presentation from within. We have to be careful what theory we take with us. And uh, we argue the hypnosis because it is the natural way of utilizing natural trance states and dissociation is the best way of getting inside. So follow the effect back and then you get away from complexes back into the instincts. At that point, things start to happen which might be beyond what we can, we can discuss meaningfully today. And that, that's not a reflection on you guys at all. It's just that the, the technicality of even working with complexes is, is such, isn't it, really, mm. that before you get down into these things, it's, uh, it's important to understand them. The student then asks, so if you encounter resistance, then you're encountering resistance from the complex itself rather than from the ego, as Freud would have put it. I would personally run with that as the initial hypothesis. So it can be set aside if, if it doesn't fit. But if I go with ego defense mechanisms, I tend to find myself wrapped up in theory. It's taking me away from the immediate experience. But because I have a forensic mindset due to my other career, I, I tend to want to know what's orchestrating things in the background. And because the ego has limited information carrying capacity, as Mark Solm says, it's, its role fundamentally is to make things unconscious as quickly as possible because it has to deal with the immediacy of the moment. Then I don't really want to be bothered about the ego's defense mechanisms. I'm going to find out what's stopping the ego from functioning properly. It has a job to do from the perspective of the inside world and from the genome. It's evolved to deal with the outside world. It's an unfamiliar place, the, the inner landscape to the ego, because everything about it is externally focused. So if it goes on the inside, it takes with it that which it can do, which is capacity to create fantasies and therefore internal projection. And it will base those on its learning. That can be cultural suggestions through a psychological theory or anything like that. So it takes in with it an attempt to understand the inner worlds as the inner with the outer. There's some correlation, but it's not exactly the same. And if that's overvalued, that's when the ego gets itself lost. So I would rather use a method which completely opens you up 
sort of natural connection with affect and therefore instinct. And what emerges then is likely to be more natural. The student then comes back with, I find personally that as a consequence of looking at complexes as having their own defences and even their own logic, it becomes quite difficult to not to reify them or consider them as sub-personalities of sorts. Have you got any tips on how to get around this? I would just, just, just very briefly say probably not tackle it head on, which I think is what you're suggesting, Steve, mm. really, isn't it? Because yeah. if you get somebody, say, with a very severe case of OCD, where there's a lot of uh, cognition going on, a lot of rumination to try and, and, and tackle that head on or just encourage someone to set it aside or even try and think differently, will be met with resistance for sure and will generate a, probably a huge amount of anxiety as well in, yeah. in terms of asking them to do that. So I think that's where something like a more naturalistic approach comes mm. into it. And, you know, we, we use a number of, of, of mm. methods, uh, hypnosis um, just being one of them. Um, and we, we have discussed recently, actually, on other seminars about the, um, the usefulness of things like enactments mm. as well, mm. um, in order to uh, basically generate an instinctive solution to such a thing. And, and we found them to be incredibly helpful with respect to conditions such as OCD, which is, has a reputation, doesn't it, really, for being difficult to work with, almost intractable. Um, but, but just to come back to what I said initially, our, I think our, both our perspective would, perspectives would be not to go for that head on, not to just try and, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, tackle cognition with cognition. No. It very, very rarely works. And yeah. well, I think one of the other observations that we've made empirically with people who suffer in that way is that very rarely, not always, but very rarely do they suffer from physical symptoms. When yeah. when the, the cognition is running, it appears to be so effective that they tend not to somaticize unless you attempt in some way to remove the cognition and then maybe yeah. it you know the complex will express itself yeah. in the body instead but um they're often very very good um at sort of fending off any kind of physical symptoms so it's just something to bear in mind again if you try and take that away the complex is likely to turn up somewhere else in some other form yeah that is that symptom substitution it is symptom it? substitution as originally yes. observed by yes, freud yes uh, and it seems the dynamics of complexes mm. explain that. Yeah. Um, so you're playing whack-a-mo if, yes. you, if you're not careful yes. with, with these things. But are. there are things that you can observe, aren't there, as mm. you've just said, mm. th to do with that. If you remove a purely cognitive element of a complex, which is always a ramified system, it's always got several layers to it. If you remove that as the manifestation, something else will appear. Yeah. Um, I would personally tend not to see that as symptom substitution, in so much as it's, it was there anyway, it was masked and, and, and mm. we're following a, a line of inquiry forensically to see where it goes. Um, we can discuss that in, in yes, more depth at some point, yeah. literally, uh, because that's very interesting. And I think it can involve a, a really useful reframe to see how these psychodynamics play out. Mm. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue your study of psychosystems analysis, then check the description for links to further resources, including our Discord server, our suite of educational handbooks, and our application page for professional training under Steve and Pauline Richards, leading to accreditation as a hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.